Welcome to today's episode of Healthful Woman, a podcast designed to explore topics in women's health at all stages of life. I'm your host, Dr. Nathan Fox, an OBGYN and maternal fetal medicine specialist practicing in New York City. At Healthful Woman, I speak with leaders in the field to help you learn more about women's health, pregnancy, and wellness. Dr. Luskin, Shari, welcome back to the podcast. So nice to see you. How are you doing? Great. Thank you. Happy birthday. Thank you so much. Not only are you an amazing doctor who takes care of your patients? Not only are you an amazing friend and colleague who decides to come here and do this podcast for me and our listeners, but you do it on your birthday. So we're celebrating. I can't think of a better way to celebrate. (laughs) (laughs) You got any big parties coming on later because of this birthday thing? Yeah. Awesome. Good stuff. Well, many, many more birthdays and health and happiness, as we say. Thank you so much. (laughs) Wonderful. So I asked you to come back because... You're great. And because the last podcast we did together was very well received and very helpful for a lot of people. And I wanted to talk about anxiety because it's pretty common and I get a lot of questions about it and we see a lot of people with it. And I'm sure a lot of our listeners either have it or know someone who has it or wants to know about it or do I have it? Is my anxiety normal? Is it abnormal? What do I do? And so you are the top of the food chain when it comes to all of these things. So we're happy to have you. Thank you. You're welcome. Excellent. So let's let's jump right into it. Everyone knows what anxiety is, right? Fine. How would somebody who's listening, let's say, know, well, I, I get anxious from time to time. I worry about this or I worry about that or I'm worried about my pregnancy or I'm worried about my job. When does that cross the line from like, I'm just worried about something to I have an anxiety disorder, like I've got a problem that needs to be addressed. It's a matter of degree and how much it interferes with your functioning. Mm-hmm. So, so a yeah. little anxiety is good, uh-huh. it kind of sharpens your performance. Right. Keeps us from getting attacked by lions and things like that. Okay. Gets you to study for a test. Okay. Do you take any tests in medical school? We take a lot of tests. Yeah, a lot of school. tests in yeah. medical school. A little anxiety is good. Too yeah. much anxiety interferes with your ability to concentrate, to plan, uh-huh. and to be effective. And that's when it's a problem. So I guess my question is, everyone's walking around the world with some level of anxiety, right? Obviously, it, it, situational based on what's going on. Okay. How many people have an anxiety disorder and don't know about it? Or how many people think they have an anxiety disorder but they don't. Do you think most people underestimate their amount of anxiety, meaning they think everything's perfectly okay, but they walking around with a crazy anxiety disorder, or they overestimate it, meaning they think that they worry so much, but in fact, it's really pretty typical and very normal. Or is everyone sort of spot on with where they are? Uh, People are definitely not spot on, but a Mm -hmm. lot of your anxiety is situationally driven Mm -hmm. or situation dependent. Right. So the first time we did a podcast together Mm -hmm. was September of 2020. Okay. Right. It's, it's in the throes of COVID. Right. Nobody's vaccinated yet. Right. It was a tense time. Okay. If you weren't anxious, Mm -hmm. you had a problem. Okay. Interestingly, patients of mine who had obsessive compulsive disorder who had spent a lot of time worrying about things that really weren't a threat. Right. All of a sudden they calmed down. It's like, oh, I've been afraid of being contaminated by by food on left on the countertop. But now there's a real threat to my existence. Right. Namely COVID-19. Right. So let me put that at top of mind and in my top priority and forget about the unwashed counter. Right. A few months of COVID and people's OCD type symptoms started to creep back Mm -hmm. because we kind of accommodated to COVID and whether it was hand washing or Purell or wearing masks, people kind of got used to the situation. So their anxiety level dropped and their underlying anxiety disorder came back. Right. Okay. Or it became more prominent. Sometimes people are really aware of how they're feeling and other times they're not. Sometimes They function at a high level of anxiety, but they think they're just functioning normally and effectively. But people around them feel the anxiety and it puts a stress on them. Right. So they want to do something about it. But until the person is willing to acknowledge there's a problem, nothing gets done. So if someone is, let's say, on a deserted island, they're alone, right? No other human contact. And that's the way they are. And they have an anxiety disorder. Is there any downside to it? You know, I mean, depression, it can affect your overall health. You can't sleep and, you know, your your mood and, you know, you're, you don't feel right in this. 
So I get it. You don't, that's something that itself is problematic. But if someone's like, I'm very anxious, but you know, this is cool. Like I'm, I'm fine with this. Is it, or is it just really the fact that you have to function in a society with other people? It's an interesting question because if you're really anxious on a desert island, mm -hmm. you wouldn't be comfortable with the anxiety. The anxiety is an indicator that you need to do something to protect yourself. Mm. So it's your it's your early warning system, or depending on where you are, your later warning system. Your anxiety is, I better find some water I can drink, otherwise right. I'm going to die. Right. Right. I better figure out a way to signal and a plane flying overhead to get rescued. Otherwise, something is going to kill me on this island. Starvation, disease, volcano. Yeah, I, I always I always sort of try to differentiate it, like you said earlier, that it's, it's whether it affects your function. You know, meaning if someone is, let's say someone looking at them would say you have an anxiety disorder, right? Because, you know, what you're doing is just way overboard. But the person doing it's like, well, you know, I get out of bed, I'm happy, you know, I go to work. I function fine. I get do what I need to do. I get my paycheck. I come home. The people I hang out with, it's not affecting my friendships, my relationships, my marriage, whatever it might be. And I go to sleep at night totally content. I don't, it's hard to call that disorder. You it's know? very hard to call it a disorder. And yeah. I don't know that that person would, but right. if their partner right. feels stressed out being around them or their kids do, right. or their coworkers right. or their direct reports, right. then it becomes, exactly. you know, maladaptive. Right. Right? Then so, I, can't, yeah, I can't go to work. I can't do my job. I well, can't, you know. That's the person who understands right. that they're anxious. On the other hand, they may become the person who's impossible to work for. And they, uh, I see. Because they're so worried about, let's, we talked about perfectionism, right? And re recording yeah. a, a sentence at a podcast right. to get it just right. Right. So if you want things just right, there's a time and a place for that. Right. You're a surgeon. Right. If you don't have the right instrument count or the right sponge count and you, right. oops. Well, there were 20 vessels and we uh, we tied off 19 and yeah. we left one un untied. That's not a time to be relaxed. Right. You need to be a perfectionist there. Right. But in other situations, if you're too perfectionistic, it interferes with your ability to do your job or for other people to do their job. Like if you're constantly micromanaging your direct reports because you don't want them to make a mistake, Mm -hmm. You can have the opposite effect. Instead of enhancing their performance, you can impede their performance because they get tense. They be, they fully recognize that they're anxious mm -hmm. in your presence. So from a sort of management consulting viewpoint, you'd have to, if somebody gets feedback that they're putting too much pressure on their employees, they'd have to examine their behavior and examine what their fears are and kind of come to grips with the fact that they're anxious about something, just to give you one example. Yeah, right. If someone came to you and they weren't sure, right? They said, you know what? I, I'm a pretty fastidious person and I have anxiety and I'm not really sure if it's a problem or I think it's a problem, but I don't really know. What do you do to assess their life, their situation, their anxiety in order to help determine, is this someone who's sort of maybe crossed the line and needs some sort of recalibration, whether that be, again, through therapy, through medication, whatever. So what is it that you do? Well, as a first step, I like to have the patient fill out a self-screening tool called, mm -hmm. called the Generalized Anxiety Disorder 7-Item Scale or the mm -hmm. GAD-7. Let me read you some of the questions sure. from that. And this is what this is like one of these validated tools that right. people use around well, the country, the world, whatever it is. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So so the question is, in the past two weeks, how often have you been bothered by the following problems? And you can rate it from zero to three, where mm -hmm. zero is not at all and three is nearly every day. Mm -hmm. Feeling nervous, anxious, or on edge, not being able to stop or control worrying, worrying too much about different things, trouble relaxing, being so restless that it's hard to sit still, becoming easily annoyed or irritable, or feeling afraid as if something awful might happen. Mm -hmm. So the reason I have patients fill that out before they've even seen me is it just gives me a ballpark idea of where they fall. If it's if it's you know zero all the way, they're not going to be very anxious. Right. If it's a twenty one, yeah, or, that's the highest score, yeah, whatever, which is yeah. the highest score, then I know they're walking in anxious. Then my job becomes to f the, figuring out what the anxiety indicates. So anxiety is a very nonspecific symptom. It's kind of like inflammation. Right. Inflammation can be 
anything from a swollen joint and rheumatoid arthritis to pericarditis, right. for example. <laughs> so, um, Or to you just bumped your knee against the table. Right, right. Yeah. And you have a bruise, <laughs> yeah. right? So anxiety is kind of a nonspecific marker. As a psychiatrist, we try to put it into some sort of diagnostic box, mm -hmm. which then guides our treatment. So a person can be very anxious because they have a really severe psychiatric disorder, such as schizophrenia, and their anxiety is accompanied by or driven by hallucinations and delusions. Wow, yeah. Okay, That's so they're going yeah. to screen positive on this. Right. But it, they don't have like sort of constant worry. They're just anxious people. It's much more than that. Right. They could be anxious because they're depressed. Anxiety is a very common symptom in depression. Right. Or they could just be an anxious person who's been anxious since they came out of the womb. Right. Can you predict when the baby is delivered who's going to be anxious? <laughs> so I'm going to tell you a story about that. Yeah. It's, it, it is interesting because some of it is obviously someone's just their own disposition, like who they are. And definitely there are babies who are more jittery, more tense, more unrelaxed mm -hmm. than others. Now, what the predictive value is of that to be to have an anxiety disorder versus just whatever, who knows, but definitely newborns have personalities. And we actually see fetuses have personalities. I mean, that they, ones that are very quiet inside versus very active inside, it definitely plays out. Again, there's, you know, there's nature and nurture. And so the nature part is going to be present at birth and the nurture happens afterwards. What you said was so, it's so interesting because I think part of the confusion, I would say part of the problem, but it's certainly part of the confusion is that the word anxiety is really a symptom, right? Mm -hmm. And it's a condition. You could have the symptom without having the condition. Like you said, I could be perfectly fine 364 days a year, but tomorrow I'm about to go to court, right? Because I'm getting sued for something and I'll be very anxious. I'll have anxiety, but I don't have anxiety disorder because as you said, it's normal. Like it's healthy to be anxious before something like that. And some may have more, some may have less, but it's a symptom. Versus you can have, an anxiety disorder where your problem is you have too much anxiety or it's an unhealthy amount of anxiety, whatever. But then on top of that, you could have, it could be a symptom of something that's a different disorder, right? You have schizophrenia and so you have a lot of anxiety, but you don't have an anxiety disorder because you're not, that's not your problem. You're not having normal anxiety. You're anxious because you think the government's chasing you because you have delusions. And all three of those, they use the same word. And I think that that's part of the confusion. It's same with depression. Like it's normal to be depressed if someone, a, love, a loved one dies, but that doesn't mean you have a clinical depression. It just means you're sad. You yeah. <laughs> um, we, we touch on a, a central problem in psychiatry, which is that our label, uh, our labeling of emotional states is yeah. very nonspecific. Right. We can save that for <laughs> later in the, later in the podcast. Right. Uh, one way to think of it is this. I already mentioned that a little anxiety sharpens your performance, right? If you're going to court tomorrow and you're anxious, the idea is not to stay up all night worrying. Right. What you're supposed to be doing is reading through the records yeah. so that when you go to court, you know what you're talking about. Right. Whether you're being sued or whether you're an expert witness, right. you have to be prepared. Right. Think about it this way. If you're walking down the street and a bus comes barreling down the street towards you, right. that should trigger your fight or flight response, right. which me makes you move right. and get out of the way right. of the bus. Good anxiety. Okay, that's good anxiety. <laughs> yeah. Bad anxiety is when you become paralyzed. Right. So, I mean, I don't know how many people that, that if you go back to 9-11 right. if you were a claustrophobic and you could only go in an elevator when you were the only person in it you would have a lot of trouble getting on an elevator as you're trying to evacuate the building right. where there are 25 people stuffed into an elevator right and so you don't get into the elevator and that's right the end of the story because right. you didn't make it out of the building right that would be bad anxiety right Clearly, if you had an elevator phobia to begin with, you weren't working at the top of the World Trade Center. <laughs> right. But it, it was, you know, it's another example of a time of high anxiety. Right. Globally, local, nationally, locally, and yeah. personally. Interesting that the anxiety around 9-11 was, was in some ways less than the anxiety around COVID. Yeah. Because COVID 
it's the COVID killed millions of people around the world. COVID right. affected everybody. Yeah. Nobody was safe. Right. So like you said, it's nonspecific. And we come back to, does it interfere with your social relationships? Does it interfere with your work performance? Does it interfere with your academic performance? Does it interfere with your ability to reach the goals that you set for yourself yeah. in your life? And if the answer is no, 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 and no, then you don't have an anxiety disorder. Yeah. Yeah. I, I almost view anxiety sort of like the word pain, right? If someone came to me, I'm a doctor, say, what's your problem? I have pain. Right, well, that can mean a lot of things, right? If if you have pain because you sprained your ankle, I would say, sorry to hear that, right? It's normal to have pain when you sprain your ankle. Let me give you something temporarily to relieve the pain or not based on how much pain it is. And you'll get better with time because your ankle will get better versus I have pain because I have appendicitis. Well, then, okay, my problem is not treat your pain, it's treat your appendicitis versus I have chronic pain. I have pain every day, all the time, my whole life. And it's they're very, very, very different things and they mean different things. And which is why the word pain isn't really, it can be a diagnosis, but it's usually not, right? It's usually part of something else or a symptom of something else. And so anxiety for probably more people have an anxiety disorder than a pain disorder, but it is a diagnosis, but someone saying they have anxiety does not mean that's their diagnosis necessarily. It's, it could be manifestation of something normal or something abnormal or unhealthy or whatever you want to call it but not necessarily specifically anxiety. You said that they could have depression and you treat the depression, the anxiety will get better or they have OCD or they have schizophrenia or whatever it might be. So it's, and, and you have to tease that out. That's your, that's why, that's why you're, you know, people come to you to, to figure that all out, right? That's exactly why they come. Well, and it's, so, when, yeah. So when you're meeting with them, you do this screen and then is it just by asking questions and you, it sort of becomes pretty obvious what the story is or does it take a long time to sort through all that? Like, how does it typically go? Diagnosis in psychiatry is made based on the history and the interview uh -huh. at this stage. Yeah. Because we don't have specific right. disorders. We don't have specific right. tests yeah. that we can do. Right. You can't do an MRI and decide it. Thank you. We test. can't do an yeah. MRI to show. Yeah. Uh, we, can, we can't do functional magnetic resonance imaging studies, right. which look at, at br brain metabolism mm -hmm. and electrical conductivity. But Again, nonspecific. Mm -hmm. If the patient is anxious, you can see certain correlates in brain activity, but it doesn't tell you what's causing the anxiety. So it doesn't help you design right. a treatment Understood. to fix the anxiety. Yeah. Now, if we're talking about anxiety as its own disorder, meaning not secondary to bipolar disorder or not secondary uh, to just normal healthy, I have a test tomorrow, but an actual anxiety disorder, there are sort of like, I don't know if they're called subtypes or if they're called like different manifestations. Like there's, I've heard like general anxiety disorder or GAD. There's social anxiety disorder. There's various phobias. And how, are they all part of the same problem? Or are they different problems? Like, how do you think, like in your own mind, how do you categorize them sort of? The presenting symptom may be, I feel anxious. Okay. Then when we tease it apart, mm -hmm. it may break down into somebody, for example, with an elevator phobia. Mm -hmm. So that person has trouble even getting upstairs to a doctor's office <laughs> if they have to take an yeah. elevator, right? So they could have a dog phobia. Mm -hmm. Now in New York, if you have a dog phobia, Big you're problem. going to be very <laughs> anxious. Or I've had patients who have a mouse phobia. Right. Right. And depending on what your building is like, there may be mice or rats or whatever. And that right. could really interfere with your ability to live because you're constantly watching yeah. for that object of your phobia mm -hmm. to appear in some way. So if there's a specific phobia, then we try to treat the specific phobia. And usually when you're treating a phobia, like a, a simple phobia, you do graded exposure mm -hmm. where you're, you, it, it can start with even saying the word that of the thing they're afraid of, I'm afraid of dogs. So right. that can make people anxious just to hear the word. Right. And right. then you can progress from speaking it to looking at cartoons of dogs, like cartoon right. pictures, and then to real pictures, and then gradually expose them to seeing an actual live animal. And what's, what's remarkable about the brain when it comes to phobias is that you can desensitize the brain. Right. So that you you learn to tolerate the stimulus and then your anxiety level decreases and your anticipatory anxiety decreases. Yeah. If I recall from 
my high school psychology class, systematic desensitization, That's right? Perfect. Oh, perfect. All right, see? And if you have a patient who's willing to do that yeah. work, yeah. it's very effective. We we have a lot of, in our own lives, a lot of, in our neighborhood, we're in Jersey, a lot of people have dogs now. Mm -hmm. And there's kids around the neighborhood, you know, X percent of them whose families don't have a dog and they have, everyone's got one kid is like, this kid's totally terrified of dogs. And it, like you said, it's, it's a situational problem. Like it's not a problem when they go to school, but it's a problem if they, they're, you know, they go on a play date or this or that. And so we've had a lot of kids in our neighborhood doing, it's not dog therapy because they're not using the dogs to give them therapy. It's systematic desensitization, but our dog, we have, we have two dogs, one of whom is kind of jumpy and one of whom is very calm and very pleasant and very sweet. And so she's like one of the go-to dogs in our neighborhood for the kids who are trying to get desensitized to dogs because our dog is like low level <laughs> because she's not too frightening. The worst she's going to do is lick your toes, you know, and she'll just sit on your lap and not do anything. But we see a lot of it and it, and it works. And I mean, it works. These kids go from literally, you know, running away in terror to taking our dog for a walk or holding her on their lap and petting her. And it's unbelievable. Yeah. And if you're a parent of a child with a phobia like that, the best yeah. thing you can do is model model the behavior for them. So show them that you're able to sit with the dog right. calmly and pet the dog and like make it okay for them to right. try to challenge their fear. Now, very often I have seen that in families mm. with a child who has a phobia, one or both of the parents or caregivers, yeah. not the caregivers, but like yeah. the parents have a phobia themselves. So yeah. they have inadvertently modeled phobic yeah. avoidance to the child. And the phobias may take have different objects. So somebody could be afraid of bees and the kid is afraid of dogs. Right. But either way, you've unwittingly shown them that when you see something you're afraid of, you withdraw, move away and avoid. Right. So sometimes you have mm -hmm. to address phobic avoidance in the parents mm -hmm. too, in order to treat the child. Right. right. What about like social anxiety? Because that's another big it, one. It's another big one that's also kind of nonspecific. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, social anxiety involves a fear that something bad will happen to you if you're in a social situation that you'll either that you'll say something that will embarrass you mm -hmm. or that other people will be saying you know saying bad things about you and it leads to social avoidance and that's mm -hmm. a very very superficial right explanation of it we were talking earlier about mm -hmm. alcohol right. in pregnancy and if you want to find patients with social anxiety disorder go to an aa meeting mm. because what's alcohol Right. It's the great social lubricant. Right. right. So people who are nervous in social situations drink. Right. They feel more relaxed. Right. Alcohol is the original tranquilizer. Yeah. Okay. And then yeah. they're able to chat, but it can the, become a problem. The alcohol in and of itself becomes right. a secondary problem. Right. It's it's always interesting to me that the field of psychiatry in in many instances has drawn a distinction between substance use disorders and underlying psychiatric disorders. Right. As if you would just become an alcoholic or a drug addict without something going on inside you that would drive the substance right. use, right. right? You have to be treating something. It's not self-medication. That's not a good right. term, but you're responding to some internal discomfort mm -hmm. and that's why you may reach out for alcohol or drugs. Mm -hmm. So in the effort to achieve and maintain sobriety, it's important to address the underlying anxiety or mood disorder yeah. or other psychiatric disorder yeah. that may accompany it. Yeah. Now, I'm sure there's some people get hit, hooked on painkillers that were right. prescribed by, I yeah. had surgery and I had one dose of codeine and threw up and somehow I had a, a pill bottle full of 30 tablets of codeine when I went home. Right. Like I wasn't taking it. Right. <laughs> it was yeah. just automatically <laughs> was given, to yeah. given to me. Yeah. So you can see how people could get hooked on painkillers. But right. then there are people who seek out painkillers, mm -hmm. narcotic pain meds, whatever. Mm -hmm. But they they must be responding to something internally. Right. What's right. your feeling on this matter? 
I know too little about this to have an educated opinion. It's, it's hard. I mean, it's it's one of these things where, you know, substance abuse, it, it runs in families frequently. So there's, you know, there's obviously a genetic component. There's obviously an right. environmental component. I'm sure there's a psychologic slash psychiatric component to it. There's got to be something organic. I mean, that they have their receptors respond differently than others. And there's so much that goes into it. But yeah, I mean, obviously so much so many people are going to their first exposure that's going to get them on the road to addiction is not typically or maybe not often something just out of nowhere right there's something you know yeah, that there's something that. and you, you mentioned that it runs in families so yeah. so which first, is both that's both which genetic is both and environmental genetic yeah. and environmental and there are you know, we know that certain enzyme profiles are different between different racial groups. Right. So your ability to process alcohol and metabolize it can vary depending on yeah. on your ethnic origins, right? So that may make you more or less vulnerable to developing an addiction because if you can't tolerate the right. substance to begin with, you're not right. likely to use it repeatedly. Right. So you talked about organic versus psychological, right? Versus... I know where you're going. I know we're going with this because I remember from September 2020. So hit us up. What do you got? Okay. <laughs> it's it's all organic. Yes. It's all neurobiological. Yeah. It's not in your mind. Organic brain disorder. Yes, it's all <laughs> it's all in your brain. Right. Yeah. If we take out your brain, you are cured. Absolutely. And that's happened to some people, and many of them are run for office. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to all you politicians out there who listen. I'm not making uh, jokes about you. Specifically. <laughs> <laughs> the, you know, and, uh, we sort of talk about sort of specifics, but what is then a generalized anxiety disorder? If it, you know, it's not necessarily one phobia, or it's not necessarily a, a substance, or it's not necessarily social. What, how would you define? It's just like in general, you're, you you have anxiety for everything. Like everything you do has anxiety. Well, if you recall that yeah. screening questionnaire that right. I that I read to you, generalized anxiety disorder means you worry a lot about a lot right. of things a lot of the time. Right. People say that it's that is much more common now you know, it's on the rise. It's, it's, everyone has it, you know, 112% of kids have it. And, you know, I mean, like, th this is what you hear out there. What What's the reality? Is it really that prevalent? Is it really on the rise? What, what's your knowledge and experience on this? My experience is that people have gotten more anxious. Okay. Now, everybody's seen the headlines, I'm sure, that the rates of depression and anxiety have increased in children and adolescents during the COVID-19 pandemic. Right. Right. You've seen that. True. Okay. Big headline this week. The rates of anxiety and depression in the parents has also gone up. <laughs> it's everyone. It's everyone. Yeah. Is, it, is it anxiety, the symptom or anxiety, the disorder? Would you say it's gone up or both? I'd have to say both. Yeah. Okay. There are some people who were inclined to worry who worry more. Right. There's some people who weren't that worried who right. have gotten very worried. Right. I have to tell you about a patient I took care of recently who I first treated 14 years ago when she was pregnant. Mm -hmm. She was depressed. She was anxious. Treated her during the pregnancy with psychotherapy which parenthetically alters brain chemistry, but sure. in a less direct way than yeah. medication. But we had psychotherapy and medication. She got through the pregnancy. She did pretty well postpartum. Mm -hmm. And then she stopped treatment, although right. she did continue her medication okay. with her primary care physician. Fast forward 12 years, she calls me up during the pandemic yeah. two years ago. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, she is super anxious. Out of nowhere. Over, out of nowhere. <laughs> <Not> I mean, <laughs> she wasn't so calm right. in hindsight right. over those intervening 10 years right. or 12 years. But now she was really, really anxious and starting to have panic attacks. Mm. Why am I so anxious? Right. Have you thought about the global pandemic? Exactly. <laughs> are you exactly. wearing a mask right now? Are you, <laughs> are you are, locked up at home? <laughs> are you doom scrolling yeah. at four in the morning <laughs> when you wake term. up? Is doom that scrolling. Oh my doom God. Doom scrolling. I love What's that. in the New York Times today How at many four died? in the morning? Yeah, I always said like it was, again, the pandemic was its own unique thing, but I was like, it did not help that no matter when you're watching TV, there's like a ticker at the bottom, how many people died that day. Right. I was like, that's just... That's not good. That's just not, not a, good that, at all. That's not helpful. And uh, when you when you have a little child who's yeah. when you have two kids who are home, one right. who's one who's twelve and right. one who's four, right, right, and you're trying to manage homeschooling. Can you imagine homeschooling with a preschooler? Oh, God, right? It's it's a nightmare. How about homeschooling with a twelve year old? 
Just also home, a just nightmare. Home, just home with the 12 year olds. Home, home with the 12 year old is, <laughs> is a nightmare. Sorry for all your 12 year old listeners out there. And, but yes, I'm giving you crap. And all right. you have some underlying medical conditions that would make yeah. you extra vulnerable right. if you got COVID. Right. Right? Yeah. Shouldn't you be anxious? Yeah. Okay, fine. So back to therapy, adjust the medications. And the question keeps coming up why am I still anxious? Well, mm. just when you thought it was safe to go back in the water, yeah. your husband got COVID. Right. By some miracle, you didn't get it. Right. But somebody in your household has it. Or how about this one? Just when you thought you were getting better, the schools opened up. So right. now your kid is going to school and it's frequent testing. Yeah. And every time, you know, you put, people have been isolated. So you put a bunch of four-year-olds together, people are going to get sick. Right. So it was like constant stressors. Oh, right. There's a better word than stressor. It's like constant exposure yeah. to threatening situations, yeah. namely COVID. Yeah. So we had lots of conversations. Why am I anxious? COVID. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Why am I still anxious? COVID. <laughs> right, right, right. Prior prior to then that you would just we would just say Trump. Right. <laughs> In New York. Why am I anxious? I'm anxious because of Trump. But now COVID. COVID and Trump. Bad combination. For exactly. New York. Yeah. Very bad. Yeah. Very bad conversation. <laughs> and very bad combination. And I won't even go down that road. Yeah, yeah, I know. Today, we, we, but... we may not have the same political beliefs, but it was a reality in New York that everyone's worried about Trump. That was the that was the thing. That's all I heard. The... Yeah, you know, no, no, I t I'm I'm on board with you. I just yeah. want to stay focused on the topic for today. I just had to say it. Oh my god, yeah. I can't I can't stop myself. The people are gonna try to edit that out. Don't edit it out. It's funny. It's okay. For people, again, we're, we're, we're going to sort of talk about treatment for anxiety for a moment. Then we're going to, that's going to wrap up this podcast and we're going to move on to anxiety and pregnancy and have it at its own unit. But just for anxiety in, in, in general, for general anxiety, the treatment is pretty straightforward, right? It's some form of psychotherapy or therapy, or again, if it's specific to a phobia exposure, like something related to therapy and then plus minus medication, correct? Correct. But okay. because the diagnosis generalized anxiety disorder is relatively nonspecific, okay. it's not always a slam dunk mm -hmm. that the person will get better. Because or they, that may they'll have, get because they may have a different condition. They as may well. have a different right. condition, or they may be severely anxious. You know how some people are just wound tighter than others. Right. Some people kind of come out of the like we talked about, right. what are babies like? And we right. know their different infant temperament. I mean, right. that was yeah. Forever. Yeah. <laughs> That's been known forever. Yeah. So if you come out of the womb right. wound tight, you're going to have to do a lot more work to become calmer. Mm -hmm. And you may, you're never going to be like hippy dippy. Right. Right. But you can be a kinder, gentler, right. calmer version. Functional. Of, functional. Right. Version of yourself. So I'd say treatment is effective. But there isn't a single treatment approach. Yeah. You have to tailor it to the individual yeah. and to their circumstances. Now, I know we're going to talk more about yeah. pregnancy in a second, but you know that when I see one of your patients, mm -hmm. I ask their partner to come in too. Right. And I don't want to reveal the trade secret. Right. But <laughs> the person in the patient's chair right. may be the healthiest member of the family. Right. And I can't treat their presenting yeah. complaints yeah. without making sure that the partner gets the treatment they need right? because they're putting a lot of, they're causing a lot of stress for the index patient. Right, right. So- My spouse is driving me crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and sometimes they right. don't even recognize that. Yeah, yeah. But it's pretty obvious if you meet with them as a couple. Yeah. You can, you That's see how the people work yeah. together. So psychotherapy changes brain chemistry. Right. And can change it in a permanent way by building new, neural connections. You mm -hmm. learn to think differently. It changes right. your brain chemistry. Medication changes your brain chemistry. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes family and couples counseling yeah. is necessary to cement those gains, which yeah. is more changes in brain chemistry. So the, the treatment has to be individualized. It has to be comprehensive. Yeah. I actually want to talk about comprehensive because it's not just the treatment. It's really, and this is where it makes a difference who's treating you. It's the evaluation that has to be comprehensive because I can't, so many people I know professionally, personally, they suffer for so long. And part of it is because the diagnosis is wrong, meaning they're just being treated straight up anxiety, but no one ever determined you actually have bipolar disorder or you actually, it's a different diagnosis. You need a different treatment because again, anxiety is just a symptom of a different problem. And so you can give someone 
some Xanax and they'll relax, you know, sort of from the medication, or you can even put them on, you know, an SSRI, but it you're like, why does it work for me? Why does it work for this person, not me? Well, if your problem isn't straight up anxiety, let's say, but it's a, it's a symptom of a bigger issue or a more complex problem, you're never going to get better. And I think that people don't always realize that just because you're family physician told you to take a little Zoloft because you're anxious, one of the reasons you may not be getting better is because maybe you have something else going on. And to really make sure you're getting a good, thorough evaluation of what your quote unquote problem is. And that's critical, critical. And this is where being an educated consumer is yeah. so important and why your podcasts are so great because- Oh, there yeah. thank you. Uh, that was a plug. <laughs> Happy birthday to me. All right. <laughs> I want to get it in before yeah. you're too famous to talk to me with, uh, yeah. with your new book coming out. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we'll talk about that. All right, yeah, go on. <laughs> I forget what I was going to say. About getting a thorough evaluation. Okay, getting a thorough evaluation. So yeah. when you get evaluated, it's important to tell the doctor, you know, what you're feeling, to report your family history mm -hmm. and to report your general medical history. So that includes your obstetric yeah. history, your heart, lung, liver, kidney problems, dermatologic problems, everything, because right. it can all, it's all yeah. connected. Same person. Yeah. Yep, and I've personally <laughs> dissected those connections, yeah. Yeah. right? So you wanna make sure that you're covering all those bases. And if the healthcare provider doesn't ask, volunteer the information Yeah. and say, you know, I did have a history of thyroid disease right? or three of my relatives had it. Could yeah. that contribute? Right. And then it's the doctor's, job to rule out those other factors that can right. contribute. Right. I always do a urine toxicology screen right. when I see patients. Yeah. I like to say we trust in God, all others pee in a cup. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because if you're doing cocaine, it can cause panic attacks. Yeah. And people yeah. don't, sometimes people tell you what they're doing and right. sometimes they don't. Right. So you do it. That's an objective and test. It, it also, it do. also, it also removes judgment, meaning I'm not selecting, oh, you're the one who I think is using cocaine and you're probably not. Cause then it's, then the doctor's biases come into it. You just say like, this is routine. We do it on everybody. You and, know, and, and like, that's exactly it's like, it's like a pregnancy a, test in yeah. the ER. Someone says, oh, there's no way I'm pregnant. Great pee in the cup, right. you know, like, like, like we need, we need to check everyone. Otherwise we could miss people or offend people. And understandably it's offensive. If someone says, you mean I'm singled out to be on drugs? Like why not everyone? You're like, no, I test everyone. Yeah. Like, I, no test, I, I test yeah. everybody routinely from age 18 to yeah. 80. And yeah. if they were 85, I'd test them too. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just not seeing that demographic at the moment. God bless. But <laughs> well, I did have a dentist come in who was who was abusing marijuana and this is he was mm -hmm. in his 70s oh, and this right. was back in the 90s good for him all right well <laughs> god he bless was, he, was he was ahead of the curve ahead of the curve he was the og excellent uh, yeah shari thank you so much for coming to talk about anxiety we're gonna wrap this one up but we're gonna jump right into anxiety and pregnancy and treatment anxiety and pregnancy but i really appreciate it. thanks for coming on your birthday i know this will be very helpful for our listeners and all of you stay tuned for the next podcast, which will drop next week, which we'll talk about anxiety and pregnancy. Thank you for listening to the Healthful Woman podcast. To learn more about our podcast, please visit our website at www.healthfulwoman.com. That's H-E-A-L-T-H-F-U-L-W-O-M-A-N.com. If you have any questions about this podcast or any other topic you would like us to address, please feel free to email us at hw at healthfulwoman.com. Have a great day. The information discussed in Healthful Woman is intended for educational uses only. It does not replace medical care from your physician. Healthful Woman is meant to expand your knowledge of women's health and does not replace ongoing care from your regular physician or gynecologist. We encourage you to speak with your doctor about specific diagnoses and treatment options for an effective treatment plan.